at 5 p.m. on the 19th of May, 1884, the yacht Mignonette was towed by the Tug Marific down the River Itchen and into history. Itchen Ferry Village was a maritime village whose population made a living fishing, smuggling and sailing. The wealthy Australian lawyer and politician, John Henry Watt, had purchased the Minionette in 1883 and wanted to have the vessel transported to Sydney. In his search for an experienced sailing master, he engaged Thomas Dudley, who would go on to find himself the centre of a court case which changed legal history. Mrs Dudley and myself had been considering a move to Australia. That's what attracted me to the Commission. <laughs> I said I could go down and test the waters, so to speak. It was also intimated that if I did a good job, I could be employed as the racing skipper for the Minionette. The trip down from Tollersbury to Southampton was hard. A severe thunderstorm. It's no wonder when we arrived, the crew left. I had to find a new crew. That was hard once rumours got round that the Minionette was unseaworthy. But I had a stroke of good fortune. Ned Brooks, someone who I'd known for many years, had moved to Southampton and was working as a rigger at Fay's Yard. Then there was Edward Stevens, a local mariner who'd worked for P&O and Reb Funnel. I just needed an ordinary seaman to take up the final place. Richard Parker was an orphan and in 1884 was lodging with Captain Jack Matthews and his wife in Itchin Ferry Village. Well, Dickie, he was a headstrong boy. He was like most of the boys in the village. He wanted an adventure to go to sea, like his father. Daniel, Daniel Parker was his dad, a well-known skipper and a good cricketer. Mary, his mother, she was a good friend of mine. It was so sad when she passed. The four boys and little Edith. And then a few years later, Daniel died as well. Richard was the youngest of the boys. Just 14 then. So we, me and Captain Jack, took him in. Captain Jack tried to put him on the right path. <laughs> but he would not stick at school. Did not learn his letters. He just wanted an adventure. Captain Jack tried to persuade him not to go on the mignonette. He could see it was unsuitable for such a long trip all the way to Australia. But Dickie would not be told. Went off, put his mark on the sign-up papers. Nothing more to be done. So we bought him a seaman's chest for the voyage. As for the rest of the crew, Edwin Stevens had been born in Southampton in 1847. His family home was at 25 Bugle Street. He was respected locally, was active in the YMCA and was a member of the Masons. Edmund Brooks was originally from Brightlingsea, the son of a mariner he had gone to sea at the age of 12. In 1884, he was lodging at the County Tavern on Melbank Street. Dudley had received £100 on account for the voyage, to pay himself and the crew and for their provisions they would receive a further £100 on delivery of the Mignonette at Sydney. We had a letter from Dickie. He would not have written it himself, of course, but 
dictated it or copied from another draft. It said, I am happy and comfortable and all on board are well. We have had a fine and pleasant voyage all the way. It was the last we heard from poor Dickie. <laughs> what happened next was a crisis. A terrible storm battered the yacht after it crossed the equator. The sea breached her stern, and on the 5th of July, it became obvious that the vessel was about to founder. Dudley ordered the crew to abandon ship, and they made their way into a 13-foot dinghy. In the terrible conditions, they were only able to salvage a compass, a sextant, and two tins of turnips. But no water. We used our oil skins for cover, rigged up boards to catch the wind, and I drew sketches of our positions in the dinghy. They were published, you know, in the Illustrated London News. We caught a turtle drank our own urine, caught a bit of rainwater, but it was, it was 20 days, 20 days adrift. And what little we had ran out. And no ship in sight. We had thought to die together. But the captain, he said it would be hard for Ford to die when perhaps one might save the rest. The captain was considering the custom of the sea, the drawing of lots to see who would be sacrificed to save the rest. He argued that he, Dudley, and Stevens were men with families to support. Dudley thought Parker was near to death in any event. Brooks would have nothing to do with the killing, though he partook of cannibalism after the event. I offered up a fervent prayer to God to forgive us for such an act. I knelt down beside the lad and I said to him, Dicky, my boy, your time has come. He whispered to me, what me, sir? I had the pen knife to his throat. And then he was dead. The boy's blood was caught and drunk. His liver and heart devoured while still hot from his body. The men lived on his remains for the next four days. Finally, after sailing 1,000 miles and being adrift for 24 days, they sighted the Montezuma. I could not believe my eyes, seeing that tiny little dinghy bobbing on the water. The captain ordered us to head towards it. It still took 90 minutes to reach it. They were so feeble. Just skin and bones. I do not know how they survived, but I found the remains. A rib and some bits of flesh. I threw them overboard. Who were we to judge? They were with us for just over a month, at 39 days to be precise, until we made port in Falmouth.
they were most surprised when they were arrested. I heard the charge. That they willfully, feloniously, and with malice of forethought, killed Richard Parker on the high seas. All three men were arrested and there was an initial hearing. The case against Brooks was dismissed as he was to become a witness for the Crown. Such were the controversy and legal disputes arising from the case. It was adjourned to the High Court of Justice to be heard before the Lord Chief Justice of England. When these men were picked up by the Montezuma, all that was left of young Richard Parker was a single rib. Now I understood, I sympathised with the conditions that these men had found themselves in. Adrift, in awful circumstances, for 24 days in an open boat. But when the circumstances of their survival became known when they returned to this country, the Falmouth Water Police had no doubts. They had no compunction. The men were immediately arrested. It was judged that they had acted willfully, feloniously, and with malice aforethought. Now it is of course true that they made no secret of what they had done. Indeed, you may feel that they boasted about their deed. The photographs taken for postcards to publicise their action. But the real question in the case was this. Whether, in all the circumstances set forth, the killing was, or was not, murder. To contend that it could be anything else was both new and strange. To preserve one's life is, generally speaking, a duty. But it may be the plainest duty, even the highest duty, to sacrifice that life. So, by what measure are the comparative values of human life to be measured? Is it to be strength, intellect? Or what? It is plain that the principle leaves it to him who is to profit by it to determine the necessity that will justify him deliberately to take the life of another in order to save his own. In this case, the youngest the weakest, the least able to resist, was chosen. Was it more necessary to kill him than one of the grown men? The answer must be no, it was not. The trial attracted national publicity. There was much public support for the accused and appeals were made for money to support their defence. The dinghy in which the men were saved and where Parker lost his life was put on display and raised £4.12. shillings. Dudley and Stevens accepted the money raised, insisting that any left over after the trial went to support Richard's younger sister, Edith. It 
may seem strange that we, Richard's family, bore no ill will to the survivors of the sinking of the Mignonette. Our family have been sailors for generations. We have suffered shipwrecks and the dangers of a life at sea and understood the custom of the sea. Cannibalism in such circumstances wasn't unknown. It wasn't talked of, never made the papers. But with, with Dickie, I think it was because he was so young. The others could have said nothing or said he had died when the ship went down. No one would have known. Daniel, my eldest brother, said Dickie would have suffered terribly from drinking the sea water. Well, 15 days adrift, he was overcome with thirst. And then his body was wrapped with pain. He was delirious, they said, and the sun kept beating down. It is not suggested that in refusing to accept temptation as an excuse for crime, it is forgotten how terrible those temptations were. How awful the suffering. How hard in such trials to keep the judgment straight and the conduct pure. We are often compelled to set standards that we ourselves cannot attain. To lay down rules that we ourselves cannot satisfy. But a man has no right to declare temptation as an excuse for crime, even though he may yield to it. Nor must compassion for the criminal be allowed to weaken or change in any way the legal definition of the crime. Their sufferings appear to have been terrible, but the doctrine of justifiable homicide has no foundation in the English law, except in the entirely different case of unavoidable self-defence. It was justified by overriding circumstances. As a result, I lost one member of my crew in circumstances where they all would have perished. The trial and its outcome were to change English law forever, and the case is still studied by student lawyers to this day. Brooks was discharged as he had taken no active part in the killing and served as a witness for the prosecution. Dudley and Stevens were found guilty and sentenced to death, but with a recommendation for mercy. The Queen, on advice from the Home Secretary, commuted their sentence to six months imprisonment without hard labour. Although Dudley and Stevens were released, and Brooks had never stood trial, the events of 1884 changed their lives forever. My husband, Captain Jack, he showed me this book that was written way back in 1836. The narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. It tells of a shipwreck with four survivors. They ate the remains of a turtle they had captured and were near delirious with thirst. They drew lots. One of them lost his life during the fearful repast and his name was Richard Parker. 
The story of the sad tale of Richard Parker has been told through song and theatre and been used as a teaching aid in university. And it was no accident that Jan Martel named the life of Pie's tiger Richard Parker. There was no body for the family to bury, of course, and no money for a memorial. But John Haskins, a London engineer, came forward and paid for a memorial stone to be placed on the grave of Richard Parker's parents. It was Daniel who chose the inscription for the memorial. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And there was another fast from the Bible. Though he slay me yet, will I trust in him? Well, that set it all. The original memorial was moved inside the west porch of Pear Tree Church to preserve it, and a new stone now sits above the grave in the churchyard. He said, he, he said uh, the, the sighting of the Montezuma occurred and as, as we were having our breakfast, we will call it. Brooks exhibited himself at a museum and toured with freak shows. Calling himself the cannibal of the high seas, he was dressed in rags and made to eat raw meat. He took to drink. Eventually, he went to live in Richard's old village at Itchin Ferry and died of a heart attack aged 73. Stevens, the other crewman, could not get his certificate of competence renewed, though he wrote 23 petitions. He also took to drink. His wife left him and he died in Hull, aged 66. Dudley served just six months in prison, but his wife was hounded out of her teaching position. So they finally put into action their plan to move to Australia. Dudley died there in 1900 of bubonic plague. cold I am bound to stay to think and drew upon that dreadful day my nights of anguish my days to dream as I recall what brought me here 